Well, good morning. Um, Timmy Ramirez Cuesta was supposed to give the presentation this morning. He's on his way to Portland, and so I will be um, presenting his talk. In some sense, my job is easy at this point because you have already had one lecture on x-ray inelastic scattering, and uh, you've heard all about inelastic neutron scattering from Bruce Gall in, on Monday, I believe. So rather than repeat a lot of things that you have already heard, uh, you're probably all experts on the physics of phonons by now, uh, I'm going to briefly summarize the way a chemist like myself uses vibrational spectroscopy, and more specifically, neutron vibrational spectroscopy uh, for chemical spectroscopy. After that, I'll show you how we do neutron vibrational spectroscopy with neutrons. And uh, I will give you a few simple examples that show the advantages of using neutrons for certain types of problems for chemical spectroscopy. And I will then conclude with a very brief introduction on how we approach data analysis. Uh, for neutron vibrational spectroscopy. So let me start by reminding you of something you already know. Uh, as chemists, we're interested in chemical bondings, chemical bonds between elements. And to a very large extent, we can think of a chemical bond between two atoms as two masses, the two atoms, um, connected by a spring that has a force constant um, K. In reality, the potential energy of two atoms in a chemical bond looks quite different. It looks like the green curve here. If R is the separation between the two atoms, uh, the potential energy looks like the green curve. You can bring the two atoms too close together. They'll start repelling each other. The potential increases. And if you separate them, uh, if they're too far apart, then the force between them goes to zero. Somewhere in between, there's an equilibrium position, uh, the bond length R0, uh, that uh, it, uh, corresponds to the um, formation of a chemical bond. The nature of the force can be different. It can be an ionic bond. It can be a covalent bond. It can be different types of um, bonding, different types of uh, forces. But by and large, any chemical bond looks like, like that. Uh, what we do frequently is we work uh, at small deviations from the equilibrium position. And then we can approximate the potential energy of the bond by a parabola. This is called the harmonic approximation. And then the system behaves like an ideal uh, spring uh, with a force constant given by the electronic density uh, between the two uh, atoms in the bonds. Now, classical mechanics tells us that for such a system, there's a characteristic uh, vibrating, vibrating frequency, which is given by the square root of k, the force constant, divided by mu, which is the reduced mass of um, the atoms in, in the bond. Now, in reality, quantum mechanics um, complicates this picture a little bit in the sense that uh, chemical bonds don't behave as classical systems. Uh, they behave as uh, quantum oscillators. And the energy uh, of vibration of a chemical bond is quantized and given by this formula here. So a series of discrete energy levels uh, appear, uh, which the um, atoms can vibrate in the chemical bond. But the characteristic frequency of the vibration, of the fundamental uh, vibration, is still given by the classical formula, basically the square root of the force constant divided by the mass. OK, so keep, keep that in mind. And it, it basically shows um, the kind of information that we get uh, out of chemical spectroscopy. Uh, fundamentally, we get information about force constants, about uh, K, and how atoms interact with each other. 
Um, a molecule, a more complex molecule, can be thought of as a collection of masses, more than two masses, all connected with harmonic springs. To a very first approximation, that's what a molecule looks like. And we're interested in the vibrational modes of this system of masses. Uh, classical mechanics tells us that such a system of n atoms um, has three n degrees of freedom. Three of these degrees of freedom correspond to the translation of the molecule in space, and three of them correspond to the orientation of the molecule in space. That leaves 3n minus 6 uh, internal vibrational modes that are not related to translation or rotation. For example, in water, which has three atoms, uh, you have 3 times 3 minus 6. You have three modes of vibrations that are illustrated um, here. You have an anti-symmetric stretch, you have a bending mode, and you have a, um, sorry, you have a symmetric stretch, bending mode, and anti-symmetric uh, stretch. So this is the type of motions that we as chemists are interested in. There's many different types of vibrational modes, and chemists roughly classify them uh, according to their symmetry. We can have a, a bond stretching motion where two atoms in, in a bond are moving along the bond direction. We have uh, bending modes. Um, for example, um, here, this is a molecule of ethanol. Uh, you have an OH group on that molecule, and that uh, hydrogen atom is moving up and down perpendicular to the bond axis. Uh, you have another type of um, motion that's also of great interest to chemists, which is torsions. Uh, in, in this case, in methanol, the, the methyl group at the end of the methanol molecule is rotating about um, this carbon-carbon axis. These uh, are particularly interest, interesting for neutron vibrational spectroscopy because these torsional motions are typically not IR or Raman active. They're very strong in the neutron vibrational spectrum. So it's already one advantage of using neutrons to study this type of, uh, of motions. Two quantities um, define the vibrational mode, the frequency uh, at which the uh, mode vibrates, and a set of atomic displacements. Uh, stretching, bending, torsions, and there is other, other types. And there is also um, connection between these different types. So uh, frequently a, a vibrational mode is not purely a stretching or purely a, a bending mode. I'll come back to that later. Molecular vibrations are useful to chemists uh, for several reasons. I've already told you that um, they depend on the molecular structure and they depend on interatomic or intermolecular forces. So we learn about forces between atoms, we learn about chemical bonding, and the frequencies, the vibrational frequencies, are affected by the molecular environment of a molecule or a particular group of uh, atoms. So we can also learn something about the molecular environment. Uh, and uh, chemists also use spectroscopy, vibrational spectroscopy, as an analytical tool. A lot of um, chemical bonds have a number of characteristic frequencies associated with them, and these frequencies don't change going from one molecule to another. So in other words, um, an OH bond, for example, uh, has a stretch, a stretching motion at around 3,600 to 3,650 in uh, alcohols, and it's very characteristic of this type of motion in an alcohol. And regardless of the alcohol that you look at, you'll find that characteristic frequency uh, in this particular range. Now, if the alcohol is free, um, the frequency falls in that range. If it's hydrogen bonded, then the frequency of the motion decreases to a lower range. So chemists frequently use um, such tables of characteristic frequencies 
to observe the presence or the absence of a particular uh, chemical bond. And there are tables, uh, big fat tables of these, uh, of these frequencies for different compounds in different molecular environments. So how do we observe uh, vibrational modes experimentally, and in particular uh, with neutrons? So crystallographers use diffraction of some form of radiation, which can be visible light, electrons, x-rays, neutrons, and so on, to obtain information on the periodic arrangement of atoms in, in space. And in that case, the wavelength of the radiation used is comparable to interatomic distances. You've had lectures on diffractions, both x-ray and um, neutron uh, diffraction. Spectroscopists use inelastic, the inelastic scattering of radiation to excite vibrational modes in the, in the molecule or a solid liquid. Um, the energy of the radiation then is comparable to the energy associated with the vibrational excitations. So in a typical experiment, um, an incident neutron with energy EI comes in and excites a vibrational mode in the molecule. And the scattered neutron then leaves the system with less energy than it came in with. So uh, this is a simplified view, um, but we're interested essentially in the difference between the energy of the incident neutron and the final energy of the neutron. And that energy corresponds to the energy of the vibrational mode that got excited in that um, collision process. Momentum is also uh, exchanged in that process, as you well know. For chemical spectroscopy, we're typically interested not so much in low energy excitations, um, such as phonons. Uh, we're more interested in internal mode of vibrations that occur at much higher energies. These modes uh, have very little Q dependence. So we uh, actually average over Q during a neutron scattering uh, experiment. So as long as we have a way to determine the neutron incident energy and the neutron final energy, and then the number of neutrons with energy EI and EF, we can determine um, excitations in, in the sample. And the result is a vibrational spectrum. So for example, um, this is the example of water again, where water has a symmetric stretching, anti-symmetric stretching, and a bending mode. Um, these then appear in the vibrational spectrum at characteristic frequency. So for example, the bending mode appears at nu2, uh, appears around 1600 wave numbers. The uh, stretches, uh, symmetric and anti-symmetric, appear at um, uh, higher frequencies. So I'm going to show you a whole bunch of vibrational spectra, much more complicated uh, than this one, in the next few minutes. Some of you may have done um, optical spectroscopy, uh, either IR or Raman spectroscopy. Certainly, if you're a chemist, you've been exposed to these techniques. And let me say a few words now about uh, the difference uh, between vibrational spectroscopy with neutrons and techniques that you may be more familiar with, such as Raman or, or infrared. Uh, by now, you know that neutrons couple directly to nuclei through the strong interaction. Whereas Raman and uh, infrared spectroscopy measure the response of electrons in the system. It's an electron-photon interaction rather than a neutron-nucleus interaction. So we see the nucleus directly. We don't see the electrons. We don't have any selection rules. The electron-photon interaction is a very complicated interaction, and it leads to a whole series of selection rules that exclude um, certain vibrational modes in highly symmetric molecules. We don't have that problem. We see everything. Neutrons, as you well know, are also uh, very sensitive to hydrogen. The neutron 
a proton scattering cross-section is very, very high. Frequently, you cannot always um, see hydrogen with optical spectroscopy. Neutrons have a high penetration, um, so we can have very bulky sample environment equipment. Neutrons will pass through it and still find your sample. You need optical access to uh, a sample in Raman or infrared spectroscopy. Um, you typically have a hard time with Raman scattering uh, going much below 100 wave numbers, very close to the elastic line. This is not a problem with neutrons. We see pretty much everything on vision, for example, from the uh, elastic line all the way to 8,000 wave numbers. Um, also, photons don't exchange a whole lot of momentum with the sample. So you essentially get the vibrational modes at the gamma point in the Brillouin zone. And if you don't know what it is, don't worry about it. Uh, this is not the case with neutrons. We actually average uh, over Q over the entire Brillouin zone. So we do see, for example, zone boundary phonons that you cannot observe with optical spectroscopy. The uh, calculation of the vibrational spectrum for neutrons is very easy, and I'll show you a few examples of that, and it's quantitative. We get frequencies, and we get also the relative intensities of the modes. This is because, again, of the simplicity of the neutron nucleus interaction. Uh, in optical spectroscopy, the complexity of the electron-photon interaction makes that calculation uh, very difficult. Another advantage of uh, neutron vibrational spectroscopy is that you don't deposit any energy in the sample. Uh, the neutron is a very weak probe, uh, and if you've ever done Raman spectroscopy on uh, adsorbed species on a sample, for example, uh, you know that the laser beam is capable of burning holes in your sample, inducing photochemistry, or can desorb species on the, on the surface of your sample. So there's a number of advantages to using neutrons as compared to using more conventional optical spectroscopies. And I'll show you a few examples of that. Now, having said this, we still like Raman spectroscopy, and we have developed recently on vision a Raman probe that allows us to do Raman scattering simultaneously with neutron vibrational spectroscopy. Raman is better at seeing um, some particular vibrational modes. For example, uh, th this, is, this is what the probe looks like. I'm, I'm not going to describe it in any great um, detail. This is a, a picture of the actual probe with the laser uh, turned on. It's blue light in this case, 488 nanometers. Uh, and it, you see here how it's arranged. This assembly, the, the probe is here, the Raman probe is there. The sample sits here in a conventional aluminum sample. We have optical coupling of the probe, the Raman probe, to the sample, and then we also illuminate uh, the sample with neutrons for neutron vibrational spectroscopy. Here's an example of a Raman spectrum collected simultaneously with a neutron vibrational uh, spectrum for a simple molecule for nitrophenol. Uh, it's just shown right here if you don't know what it is. And what you see is that um, some modes appear simultaneously in, in the Raman spectrum. Uh, this mode at 308 wave numbers, for example, appears in the Raman spectrum as well as in the neutron vibrational spectrum. Some modes um, here in this range are either absent in the Raman spectrum but show up strongly in the neutron vibrational spectrum, or they're a lot more intense uh, for uh, neutron uh, uh, vibrational spectroscopy. Uh, there are modes, for example, um, this one here, which show up in strongly in the Raman spectrum, which is essentially absent in the neutron vibrational spectrum. This is a mode associated with um, the nitro group on the benzene ring here. And um, we don't see it in the uh, neutron vibrational spectrum because the scattering from nitrogen and oxygen is much too weak.
So there are advantages to combining both techniques and doing both Raman and neutron vibrational spectroscopy simultaneously. Uh, this is a picture of the uh, bottom of the probe where no sample can has been attached uh, to uh, the quartz rod that connects the, um, the probe, the Raman probe to, to the sample can. Um, specifically, how do we do neutron uh, vibrational spectroscopy? Uh, you've probably heard about um, direct geometry instruments and indirect geometry uh, instrument. Uh, we basically need to determine h bar omega, which is the difference between the energy of the incident neutron and the energy of the scattered neutron. You can do that in two, you, you cannot um, simultaneously determine EI and EF. You have to fix one and measure the other experimentally. In a direct geometry instrument, you monochromate the incident beam, so you fix the energy of the incident neutron and you measure the energy of the scattered neutron. In an inverted geometry instrument, you do the opposite. You essentially fix the final energy of the neutron and you measure the incident uh, energy of the neutron. At SNS, we do that by uh, time of flight. This is what we do at um, vision. This is beam line 16B, uh, which is used for vibrational spectroscopy. It's an inverted geometry instrument. We, it looks like this. Some of you have seen it uh, over the past two days. Um, this is what the instrument looks like. Uh, it's about eight feet tall, uh, just to give you an idea of the, um, of the size of the instrument. And it was commissioned about two years ago and is now fully operational. It has a very wide dynamic range for vibrational spectroscopy, zero to a th one EV, basically, uh, which translates into zero to 8,000 wave numbers if you're a chemist. Um, we can do simultaneous diffraction and inelastic uh, neutron scattering on that instrument. We operate in a range of five to about 700 Kelvin, and we have a wide variety of uh, sample environment, high pressure, electric field, gas loading in situ, and so on. I'll show you a few examples of that as we, as we go. Um, the, on vision, the beam comes in this way, passes through this um, diffraction detector, hits the sample, which sits at the center of, of this uh, donut-shaped um, system. And uh, in fact, I think I have a better picture of this. Uh, so the neutrons leave the moderator, hit the sample uh, here. They scatter in all directions. Uh, they hit an analyzer mirror, which is essentially uh, you see one of those uh, here, a series of um, graphite single crystals. The neutrons that have the right energy to brag reflect on the crystal do reflect on the crystal and reach the detector. The neutrons that scatter with the wrong final energy simply pass through the mirror and never reach the, the detector. So we use essentially Bragg scattering on a graphite mirror to select the final energy of the neutron, and we measure the incident energy of the neutron um, from its uh, time of arrival at the, at the detector. This is some of the sample environment that's available to users uh, at Vision. I've already showed you the Raman probe, uh, which is still experimental at this point. This is a workhorse. This is a top lo loading refrigerator that operates between five and 700 uh, Kelvin. But we also have a, a, a lot of interest in high pressure work and we have a large collection of high pressure cells, um, clam cells like this one. We have uh, gas cells and I'll show you an example of some work done recently with a gas cell on hydrogen. We also recently developed a diamond anvil cell um, to do uh, vibrational spectroscopy at very high pressures. Uh, so far, 
vibrational spectroscopy has been limited to about 20 kilobars with conventional clam cells. This diamond anvil cell uh, will hopefully take us someday to close to 200 kilobars. And there's a lot of interesting chemistry that has never been explored with neutron vibrational spectroscopy that takes place in, in that pressure range. Um, we do a lot of catalysis and surface chemistry and gas handling experiments. So we have a gas handling panel here that allows us to dose gases, inject gases, take gas samples and so on out of, um, out of the uh, sample. We do a lot of work with hydrogen. We're very good at seeing hydrogen. And uh, we like to use para-hydrogen, which has a much higher scattering cross-section for neutrons than normal hydrogen, which is 75% orthohydrogen and only 25% uh, para-hydrogen. So we, we cook our own para-hydrogen, 100% para-hydrogen, for a lot of experiments. Uh, we've recently been playing with uh, impedance spectroscopy and electrochemistry in, in, the, in the neutron beam. The instrument is a very high throughput instrument. Um, the white beam from the moderator hits the sample and the, uh, the flux on the sample is extremely high. This is an example of a one gram of a material called octamethyl POS. Uh, never mind what it is, it contains quite a bit of hydrogen. And we compared the spectrum obtained in uh, these different amounts of times for, from a fraction of a minute uh, all the way to about an hour and a half. And what you see essentially is that after, and, and this, is, um, this is better shown on this uh, picture down here, uh, what you see is essentially after five minutes, you don't see any differences in the spectrum. You're not really learning anything else. This allows us to do um, kinetic studies with neutrons. If you have a phenomenon that's slow enough, uh, catalysis for example, um, that takes place on the time scale of several minutes, you can actually now follow that uh, phenomenon in time with neutrons. We have a high sensitivity, high flux, which gives us access to very small samples. Neutron, has, neutron scattering has always been a, a flux limited technique, intensity limited technique, uh, which limited the size of the samples that you could run on the beam line. Uh, in this case, we, here's a couple of examples of very small samples. For the diamond anvil cell work that I uh, mentioned a few minutes ago, we needed to know how small a sample we could actually measure on the beam line. So we took some table sugar and we measured a spectrum with smaller and smaller amount of sugar from 3.8 grams all the way to 1.25 uh, milligrams. And the ref or reference spectrum, the black line here, is for uh, several grams of sugar, sucrose, uh, and the red line here is for 1.25 milligrams. We had to count for quite a while, 16 hours, but the spectrum is still uh, recognizable as the spectrum of sugar. We can also see very weak scatterers, uh, such as CO2, for example. Uh, this is an example of surface chemistry where we um, reacted uh, CO2 at the, at the surface of uh, a sample, which is amorphous carbon uh, in this case. And we, what you see here is the bending mode of um, CO2. And as the sample reacts, that uh, green, uh, sorry, the green, the black line uh, which was CO2 absorbed in the sample, decreases in intensity, and you see the conversion of this uh, CO2 to something else with the formation of water, and this is the, uh, uh, the red trace here is uh, the uh, librational band of, uh, of water. This corresponds to uh, about two and a half milligrams of, of uh, CO2, very tiny amount. So we have a lot of uh, flux, we have a lot of sensitivity. Uh, here is the, di and the diamond anvil cell. Um, you can see it here with um, the two uh, 
polycrystalline diamond anvils. We, this is our first test of the diamond anvil cell on the vision beam line. Uh, we measured hexamethylbenzene. The reference spectrum, the black line is the reference spectrum for hexamethylbenzene. And the green line is the hexamethylbenzene spectrum measured after two hours on the beam line with um, 1.5 milligrams of sample. That's a 1.6 cubic millimeter sample, very, very small. And you can compare the green line to the black one. They're they essentially contain the same features. Uh, we then applied pressure, and then the, the, the green spectrum turns into the, the red one. We went to uh, four GPA uh, in this case, and then one of the anvils broke. We, vibrational spectroscopy is sensitive to molecular structure. It's sensitive to conformation. Here's a recent example of that. Uh, xylose and ribose are two uh, sugars, um, so an aldopentose. They have essentially the same composition. Uh, the only difference between them is that this OH group is pointing in one direction re relative to the uh, ring in xylose and pointing in the uh, other direction in, in ribose. You can see the, the difference between the vibrational spectra. There are a number of similarities, but uh, there are also some significant differences, and they're related to the fact that this OH, this uh, hydroxyl group, points in a different direction in both conformers, uh, and then the, the ring also has a, a different uh, structure. So we're sensitive to uh, this sort of thing. This is a recent example from a user who was uh, interested in studying the interaction of water with these sugars. Uh, I told you that neutrons have very high penetrability. Here's another high pressure example. This is a copper beryllium cell, uh, which is approved for use with hydrogen at high pressure. It's rated for uh, seven kilobars. We have a pressure intensifier that is capable of pressurizing any gas you want to a very high, uh, up to seven kilobars. And you see here the vibrational spectrum of normal hydrogen, which is a mixture of para-hydrogen and, and uh, ortho-hydrogen, as a function of uh, pressure. A lot of interesting things uh, happen in that spectrum. It's too complicated for me to spend any time describing these um, changes, but you can see that the f this phonon here at five milli electron volts at ambient pressure changes dramatically, shifts dramatically with increasing pressure. This very strong, intense line here is the reason that we like parahydrogen. It's the rotational level uh, corresponding to the transition from J equals zero to J equals one in, in hydrogen. So from para-hydrogen to ortho-hydrogen. It makes it very easy to detect uh, para-hydrogen and follow a reaction, uh, for example, a hydrogenation reaction involving uh, para-hydrogen on the surface of a catalyst. Uh, this rotational level shifts with pressure and this is an effect that had been predicted theoretically, but never been observed systematically before. Here's a few more examples of what he, the chemist can do with neutron vibrational spectroscopy. Uh, this is uh, polybenzene nanothreads. Uh, this is basically squeezing benzene molecules at very high pressure and inducing the polymerization of benzene with itself. Uh, you can see how it, how it happens here. Under pressure, these um, benzene molecules essentially stack up. They start forming uh, bonds with each other. It is a relocalization of the pi electrons on the ring. And eventually, this uh, stack of benzene rings polymerizes into a new structure uh, here which they called um, a na nano thread. This was published in Nature Materials in 2014. Now, they were looking for uh, evidence that they had indeed formed these nano threads. Uh, 
The samples are not crystalline, so diffraction was essentially useless. They did some Raman spectroscopy, but it's a black sample, and so it absorbs visible light and didn't really get much more than a couple of vibrational modes corresponding to carbon-carbon uh, double bonds or CH bonds. So they came to us and asked, well, could you do neutron vibrational spectroscopy on, on this system? And you have to understand that the, the sample is made in a diamond anvil cell at 20 GPA, and you make only a fraction of a milligram of a sample at a time. So they sent a graduate student to SNS to do 100 syntheses of this material to make enough material for neutron vibrational spectroscopy. They promised 100 milligrams. Then they came back saying, well, maybe 30. And they finally delivered three. Uh, so we measured three milligrams of, of these carbon nanothreads. And the, what they, the question they wanted to answer was, well, you know, we could possibly have graphene. We could also have a different nanothread structure, or we could have what we think we have. And we, we collected the vibrational spectrum. It took about 24 hours to get a very noisy data. This is the, uh, the red uh, trace that you see here. And then we calculated the vibrational spectrum for these three different models. And the only one that really agrees uh, with the experimental data is the carbon nanothread uh, system. So this is work that's uh, about to be published in, in Nature. So you can use neutron vibrational spectroscopy uh, for model validation because you can quantitatively predict the neutron vibrational spectrum. And I'll give you a few more examples of that as we go along. Another uh, problem that's of interest to me is the problem of solubility. We have no microscopic uh, uh, theory of solubility. We have a lot of empirical data, we have a lot of phenomenological models, but we don't really, we can't really quantitatively predict the solubility of, say, a solid in a, in a solvent or the miscibility of two different solvents. This is a very important problem for chemistry, in particular for the chemical industry. Uh, and one way to approach this problem is to get a better understanding of intermolecular forces between molecules, between a solvent and a solute, for example. Uh, one model system that's very interesting uh, is these deep eutectic solvents that are used a lot these days in green chemistry. And the, the, the study of liquids and solutions has been, uh, has advanced greatly uh, with diffraction and in particular pair distribution function work. There has been much less work done on the vibrational spectroscopy of solutions and solute-solvent uh, interactions. It's a bit of a problem for neutrons because we're good at seeing hydrogen, and hydrogen bonding is very important in many solvent systems. Uh, the problem is that neutrons have mass. They exchange momentum with the sample and recoil then broadens and shifts the vibrational modes in the, vib in the vibrational spectrum. Nonetheless, there is a number of interesting work that you can do using uh, neutrons and frozen solutions. This is a very simple example of uh, what we can do today at Vision. This is a eutectic system between acetonitrile and chloroform. You can see here the eutectic diagram. The melting temperature, the eutectic temperature, is 182 Kelvin. At the eutectic composition, the mixture behaves as a pure substance. And uh, it does so because it forms a particular complex that has a well-defined structure that hasn't really been studied very well. Uh, this particular system is interesting because it's highly non-ideal. Non um, the excess 
entropy of mix mixing is about 800 joules per mole. So it's a very, very non-ideal system. And one of the questions is, what is the structure of this complex that uh, occurs at the eutectic composition? And we did some spectroscopy on vision uh, on this system at different temperatures crossing the eutectic temperature. Now, this is interesting, not so much because of the spectroscopy itself, but because vision has a diffraction detector. We can do simultaneous diffraction and inelastic neutron scattering. So uh, this is an example of the how the diffraction pattern changes on vision between 2.2 and 3.7 uh, angstrom despacing, uh, coupled, collected at the same time as the uh, neutron vibrational spectrum. And so we're hoping that someday this kind of studies where you get the simultaneously the structural information and the inelastic scattering information will shed some light on, um, on liquids and solutions. Uh, this is, in fact, the diffraction detector on vision. This is a backscattering diffraction detector. It has 80 helium tubes arranged uh, radially on this uh, circle here. It, um, it has a collimator between the sample and the detector, uh, which is actually a 3D printed collimator. So this is a collimator that was printed uh, by a company in California. And you can see here a segment of this, of this uh, collimator here. It has, a, it has a shape of a cone. You can see actually a few test pieces uh, here that were printed here at ORNL. You can see the effect of the improvement of the quality of the diffraction pattern with no collimator. And the collimator is a diamond, standard diamond uh, powder. So we can actually do Riedfeld refinement on uh, diffraction data collected on vision. Every experiment systematically collects the diffraction data. So you can always look at the diffraction uh, from your sample as well as the um, neutron vibrational spectroscopy. Uh, here's another example of these uh, eutectic systems that is actually quite interesting because it's a eutectic between acetonitrile and carbon tetrachloride. This is again a, non a highly non-ideal solution. Uh, the excess uh, enthalpy is now negative, minus 800 joules per mole. And the eutectic structure differs when this liquid is cooled quickly, if we quench it in liquid nitrogen, or if we cool it slowly from room temperature. And the diffraction shows that the final structure that you uh, obtain for the eutectic composition is very different. Uh, I think the black line is fast cooling, the red line is slow cooling, and you can see this difference in structure is also reflected in the neutron vibrational spectrum. Um, let me s conclude by saying a few words about the analysis of the results. I showed you a vibrational spectrum for water. It had three vibrational modes, and I can analyze that very easily. Now, consider a metal organic framework that has 400 atoms per unit cell. The number of vibrational modes is over 1,000. The spectrum is much too complicated for a human being to sit down, and even with tables, uh, you'd have a hard time assigning the vibrational modes in, in the spectrum. So how do we interpret uh, the results? I mean, this is an example of a vanadium uh, MOF 300, uh, MFM 300 uh, sample with two different oxidation states for vanadium, uh, plus 3 and plus 4. And you can see that that spectrum is horrendously complicated. And there is even more complex um, spectrums. If you go to polymers or very large uh, organic systems, it gets even more uh, difficult. So how do we handle that? Uh, you do have a lot of information in the neutron vibrational spectrum because of molecular environment, structure, conformation, and so on. Uh, but how do you exploit that information? And it's relatively easy with neutron scattering. It's a lot easier with neutrons than it is with x-rays, for example, or 
with um, visible light because of the very simple interaction between the neutron and the nucleus. If you have a nucleus at position R, the uh, interaction potential of, with the neutron is described essentially by a delta function in space and a single number which is independent of energy. It's the cross-section for neutron nucleus scattering. For x-rays or for visible light, this number is energy dependent. The simplicity of this interaction makes it possible to calculate the S of Q and omega quantitatively for the neutron vibrational spectrum. So we can calculate frequencies and displacements from a known structure. So we still need crystallographers. Uh, and we, we use for that uh, various density functional theory, molecular dynamics, molecular mechanics codes. If you can get these frequencies and displacements in the harmonic approximations or beyond the harmonic approximation, you can calculate quantitatively the neutron vibrational spectrum. And here's an example. Uh, sorry. Here's an example uh, for hexamethylbenzene, again, where the orange line is the vision data and the purple line is the calculated vibrational spectrum. So if you compare the purple with the orange, uh, except for a scaling factor, you can see that the calculation reproduces uh, not only the position of the vibrational modes, but also their relative intensity. So the relative intensity of the modes is related to the displacements to the symmetry of the mode. And so the intensities in the vi neutron vibrational spectrums are also meaningful. They're related to the eigenvectors of the dynamical matrix. This is typically how we do it. This, me this method of analyzing neutron vibrational data is very important to us. In fact, vision, the vision beamline, has a dedicated computer cluster with about 1,500 nodes that does nothing but compute systematically the vibrational spectrum of every single sample that we measure on the beamline. In fact, the computations frequently run in parallel with the neutron uh, scattering experiment. So you get feedback from the calculation in real time. Uh, this, we, we typically run a DFT code such as a VASP or quantum espresso. We obtain vibrational modes and frequencies. We fold in the neutron cross sections and we get a simulated inelastic neutron scattering spectrum. In parallel with this computation, we put a sample on the beam line, we do data reduction and analysis, and then we compare the calculated spectrum with the measured spectrum. From this, we get a peak assignment, so we can assign the vibrational modes, the symmetry of the modes, and so on. Uh, and then we can extract a lot of information, such as um, anharmonicity or um, whatever the purpose of the experiment is. We, can, we look frequently at chemical transformations. So we do chemistry in situ on the beam line, and we use um, the characteristic frequencies of certain chemical bonds to see if these bonds either disappeared or formed uh, during the experiment. The, the spectrum is actually much more complicated than what you get from a simple harmonic approximation. For example, in the spectrum of hexamethylbenzene, the benzene ring with uh, six methyl groups attached to the ring, uh, you can see that the calculated fundamentals are in, appear here in red, okay? And you also have overtones and combination bands that complicate the spectrum greatly. So for example, the first overtones and combination modes appear in, in green here. Uh, you have second overtones and, and higher uh, order overtones. Uh, they all add up to form the experimental spectrum, but all this can be calculated and interpreted from the calculated vibrational spectrum. Um, I think I'm running out of time uh, here.
I can show you a few more examples. So this is a gate opening in a metal organic framework. This is ZIF-8. It's a very uh, popular metal organic framework these days. You can see the unit cell. Uh, it has a lot of atoms. And the particular user was interested in this gate opening effect. There is an imidazole ring in the system that seems to rotate uh, depending on how much uh, nitrogen you put in the unit cell. And this diffraction was essentially useless in seeing this motion of the imidazole ring or a series of imidazole rings that can either open the pore or close the pore. And they asked us if we could get some spectroscopic evidence for this um, opening and closing of the imidazole uh, ring, opening and closing of the, of the pore. And so we measured the spectrum, the vibrational spectrum of this MOF at vision. Uh, the black line here is the blank. It's the empty uh, metal organic framework. And the red line is what happens to the spectrum when you stuff the pores with nitrogen. And you can see there's some very, very subtle changes in, in the vibrational spectrum. And in fact, if you model these two situations, the blank and the um, metal organic framework stuffed with, uh, I think it was close to 50 uh, nitrogen molecules in, in per pore, you can actually calculate the vibrational spectrum for both the blank and for the uh, loaded MOF. And you can see that the calculation actually repro reproduces very well these very subtle changes that you can see in, in the vibrational spectrum. Um, this is another example that I'm going to skip because I'm running out of time. I'll just leave up the uh, summary slide and take any questions that you guys may have.